Good morning. As we get ready to worship today, I was just thinking of this scripture this morning in Psalm 34. It says, I will exalt the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my lips. And I just think of that because uh, through this week, sometimes some of us have had a bad week. We've had some pretty disastrous things happen to us, but then others have had a great week. We've had uh, great things to share. And so whether, whether it's been a bad week or whether it's been a good week, we've chosen to come today to worship Him. It's a choice we make to worship Him today. And so let's join together and with all our hearts, let's stand in our living rooms. Let's really decide that we're gonna be a people of worship this morning. Let's pray as we begin our service today. Lord, we've come to worship you today. In all circumstances, we will choose to praise you. Whether our week has gone well or whether our week has gone tough, Lord, I choose this morning to stand in my feet and worship you as my Savior and my King. Amen, amen. Let's join with Alex again and his team and worship this morning with all your heart. Just give all your cares to him and choose to worship him. Hey church, it's so good to be with you today. Wherever you're joining us from, let's just worship together. Let's sing this out, the passion of our Savior.
thank you, Jesus. Today we worship you, our Lord and Savior, our risen King. And we thank you, Jesus, that you have sent us the Holy Spirit as an advocate, as a friend, as a comforter, as a helper. And you go before us and you empower us through your Holy Spirit. And this morning as we worship and we open our hearts to you, Jesus, we ask that you would change us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be made new. That we would sense something new in the way that you are with us today, Jesus. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit with us through this chorus.
over the last several weeks, uh, it's just been extremely encouraging to me as I've had the opportunity for, to pray for other people more than it seems like I normally have. And, you know, God has spoken to me and encouraged me during this time because he's indicated that, you know, as faith is a gift to each and every one of us, that that gift we can turn into action. So as in James 2, it says where uh, there's faith uh, without works or without action is dead. And that where a man who has faith but doesn't have action, I will show you a man what his faith is through his actions. And so one of the opportunities we have is to pray for those people around us. I've had the opportunity to stop and pray and it's opened my eyes and I've seen blessings. I've seen answers to prayer over the last few weeks. And I hope that you will see the same thing. So let's pray for our fellow members here at the church and those and family and those around us. Let's pray with the, for these particular items on the screen now. Now we have an opportunity to expand beyond the Wenatchee Valley and our own friends and family. And let's pray for these needs that we know about throughout this nation and throughout the world. At the same time, it's amazing to see all the blessings and all the responses we're getting back from people. So let's look at these praise reports that we're getting from people for those that we've prayed about or those that want to share the blessings that God has given to them. You know, I just love living in the Wenatchee Valley this time of year. During the springtime when we get the opportunity to just enjoy the blossoms that are coming out in the various orchards and then also to prepare for the farmer's market that will be opening at Pibus Market. The opportunity to be able to see and be blessed by all this new life and new growth that comes from the, an agricultural community like ours. But in Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower it says that the kingdom of heaven is like the man who plants good seed. And we believe that today as we get prepared for our tithes and offerings, that God is gonna use that which we give back to the kingdom and is gonna produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. We may not see the harvest, but I can tell you right now that God knows and is faithful to what we give today. So he will do great and mighty things. So let's pray over the offering today. Heavenly Father, we're blessed to be part of this community called Pray Center. We're blessed, Lord God, to be part of a greater kingdom that has an opportunity to change and transform the world. Use these tithes and offerings to bless our families as well as those in the community and those in the kingdom around the world that need you. We pray, dear Jesus, that you will speak to our hearts and give us a generosity, Lord God, that goes beyond anything of our own will, but Lord, is your will here on, on earth. So we just ask, Lord Jesus, to be with us today in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Praise Center family. I want to start off today by congratulating the Johnston family, who were the winners of our $50 gift card. Shelby won that by responding to my email last week about what they're doing in their home to have fun and to grow in the Lord together. If you didn't get a chance to respond to that email, I still would like you to, because my goal in that is that I would be sharing some of these ideas as we go through the weeks so that we can all have new ideas of how we can grow together and have fun as a family. You know, one thing that we read this week in our Bible plan was about King Josiah. What an amazing king. And something that stood out to me that that I hadn't seen before was that the Passover had not been being celebrated, not through the time of the judges or the kings. 
And he saw that and he fixed that. He reinstituted the celebration of the Passover, which was when they remembered how God had taken them from the land of Egypt and slavery and brought them out into the promised land. And then in verse 25, it says this about King Josiah. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, nor did any like him arise after him. That's just what we talked about last week. And I see a connection between remembering what the Lord has done for us, celebrating it, and then being able to love him with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength. And we wanna give you as a family a way to do that this week. See, this is the first Sunday of the month, and normally if we were in the building together, we would be celebrating communion as a Praise Center family. But we're gonna ask you this week to celebrate communion as a family around in your home, around your table, or wherever else you would like to do it. And before you let that intimidate you, I am gonna send you some information later today in how you can do that if you need some ideas. But remember that the first communion was celebrated at the end of a dinner meal with Jesus and his disciples. And the purpose of, of communion is again to remember what the Lord has done for us. In this, we're remembering that He allowed His body to be broken. He, he allowed His life to be taken so that we could walk in forgiveness of our sins, that we could live eternally with, with God in heaven, and that we could have that power, that same power that raised Him from the dead is available to us to live the way He wants us to live. So when we take communion as a family, that's what we're doing. We're just celebrating what he's done, remembering what he's done, and talking about it together, which I believe will help us get our family into a place of learning to love the Lord with all our heart and with all our mind and with all our strength. Now, if you're a single person today and you don't want to do this alone, then give me a call or give one of our other pastors a call because we'd be happy to take communion with you over the phone or over a Zoom call. We don't want anyone to feel left out in this process. So please do this with us. It's gonna be a great time. If you need to, pause your video, print off that coloring sheet I sent, grab coffee, grab your Bible, and then settle in for this great word from Pastor Sal. I'm glad you're watching this today. I uh, took a little bit of heart in our recent uh, announcement by our governor that uh, they're in a phasing in plan. There will be groups of 50 at some point that will be allowed to meet. And I just want you to know at Praise Center that as soon as that, happens. We're prepared to do multiple services so we can be back together. So we hope that that's soon and uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, last week we talked about moving from a people who basically saw men as trees walking. In other words, we didn't see things clearly to begin to see people or to see things better and to see things clearly and, uh, and to see the will of God for our lives. Uh, we, it was about seeing things as God wants us to see them. But this week, I want to go a slightly different way with that idea. And I want to ask you this question. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? That's the title of the message today. And it's from Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. The, the idea of navigating life, how do you navigate life? What is, what is it that's in you, your bedrock, if you will, of principles that make you go forward as you are? How do you go, especially through these hard times in life that we face, and how are you doing through all of that? How do you view yourself in these times? Do you see yourself as weak, as a victim, as someone who is struggling all the time, or do you see yourself as someone who is triumphing, who is strong and courageous and moving forward? forward. And, and I guess I want to just say to you, to do anything of significance in this life, we're going to have to get something of strength and courage down deep in our souls to be able to press forward, to move forward. So I encourage you today, in, endeavor to be someone who is strong and courageous as we move forward. Uh, there's a story that's told that once there was this billionaire who uh, had a massive property and a large swimming pool, but in his swimming pool he kept a bunch of alligators. And one day he was having this party and he invited a bunch of guests over. And off the cuff, just being kind of cantankerous, he said to these guests, he said, hey, I'll give a million dollars to the first person who swims across this swimming pool, reaches the other side unharmed. And uh, before much had passed, all of a sudden there was a mighty splash and everybody looked and, 
in amazement as this man began to swim like crazy across the, 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 uh, the uh, pool to the other side. And he was so fast and he jumped up out of the other side and the, the billionaire rushed up to him and said, oh, I'm amazed. I'm surprised anybody had the courage to do that. I'm just shocked. And I guess I'll have to pay up uh, uh, your million dollars. And the man says, I don't care about your million bucks. I just want the guy who pushed me in. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know, you know, when it comes to things like that, there's sometimes there's things that look like courage that are really not courage and we're forced into it, I guess you'd say. But, but I believe there's primarily one thing, one thing that we need to have courage for, and that is to see ourselves as God sees us. It, and I think this could be revolutionary and life-changing to every single one of us if we'll let it. So, so to help us, we're looking at this story of Gideon in the Bible. Uh, after the Israelites made it to the promised land, they uh, lived in the land for a while and did okay under Joshua's rule and uh, watching over them. But uh, eventually, or leadership I meant, but, but after a while, things began to go downhill. You, if you've read the story in Judges, you read this continual cycle up and down of like, oh, they cried out for help, God helped them with a the judge, and then they go into this time of just wiped out again, doing poorly. And, and so uh, they continued to go through these cycles of being overrun by neighboring nations. And then the people again would cry out for help. God would send a judge. Well, we, we're going to pick up one of those cycles here where they are overrun because they have sinned. They have gone against the things that the Lord has called them to. And here they are in trouble again. So picking it up in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like a swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. We're going to read the rest of the text in a few moments, but I wanted to stop there, pray over this message, and then get rolling. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word uh, through this medium, through this ability of technology. We praise you for it, God, that we live in such an age. And God, we continue to pray for ourselves, for our nation, for uh, the, the world around us, Lord, that again, this virus would be cursed and stopped in Jesus' name, that you would help anyone who's suffering in any way right now, God, to be um, just helped and blessed and, and moved out of that place. But God, help us all, I pray, as we go through your word today to understand what it really means to see ourselves as you see us. We need help from your spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so so uh, many of you know my story uh, growing up, but I grew up in Massachusetts and, and just pretty close to the city of Boston, actually, in the north. And it was definitely a city, city life, if you will, for a young boy growing up and and uh, But over time, eventually we moved uh, a bit to the north. I think about 20 miles to the north, there's a, a town called North Reading. It was very rural. I, I think it probably still is to this day, kind of a rural sort of New England town, as you might imagine. And, and we moved into this neighborhood. And the funny thing was, over my lifetime, it seemed like we moved every single year. So I, I was not good at making friends. Or if I made friends, let me put it this way, it, it was we moved away from them the next year. And sometimes my mom would move just across town and I'd end up in a new school and with new kids and the old kids were gone and just the way it was. So I never really had a lot of long-term friends growing up. But when we moved to North Reading, it seemed like it was going to be for a while. And so um, I quickly met a boy in the neighborhood that was about my age, whose name was Alton. And Alton and I became instant friends. We hung out. We did all kinds of stuff together. And, and I'm not really sure what happened to this day. And I really want to take the blame for it because I really do believe it was my fault. But to be honest, we had a, a falling out. We had an argument. And, and this was in the uh, fifth grade. So for the sixth 
in seventh grade and even into the beginning of the eighth grade, I just was, uh, we just never talked to each other. And when we saw each other, it was always this kind of unspoken animosity and, and hatred toward each other that never really was resolved, never, never was taken care of. And so, so one day in the eighth grade, early uh, in the season of the eighth grade, uh, I saw a group of my friends all in, in a circle in the hallway during a uh, lunchtime or something like that at school. And uh, I was interested in going up and talking to these people that I believed were my friends. And, and uh, when I got into the, kind of wiggled my way into the group, there was probably eight people in this group. They, they were talking about a party. And, and in the past, I'd been invited to a lot of these parties, just, you know, these young teen parties where we'd, uh, you know, there wasn't anything much going on other than just listening to loud music and hanging out. But, but uh, so anyway, I was, uh, I heard him talking about a party and I spoke up, but, but, but before I spoke up, I happened to notice that this group of friends, that Alton was in this group. And so I, I said, what party? Party. And uh, Alton looked across the circle at me and he says, you're not invited, Sal. And then he said these words to me. He said, don't you know that nobody likes you? And, and I was kind of like, you know, this is a, I'm an eighth grade boy. I'm looking around this circle at people I thought were my friends. Nobody spoke up. Nobody defended me. Nobody said, I like you. You know, uh, nobody said a word. And, and, as, as you know, I look back and I think I should have just shrugged that off and laughed it off. But at that age, and I know you have gone through things like this too, at that age when he said that to me, I took it to heart. I believed it. I, I, I would, ev the evidence was clear to me that what he had said was true. And so I ended up, and of course, now I can look with perspective and realize the devil was ready to pounce on that situation. So for the next two years of my life through the, through the eighth and ninth grade, I lived uh, isolated. I lived apart. I really hardly ever spoke to anybody. I believed the lie that nobody liked me, that nobody cared about me. And, uh, and, and I went on like that for, uh, for uh, like I say, those two years until in 1973, we moved across the country to a new town. I received the Lord in that summer of that year. And, uh, and suddenly, <laughs> I not only had a whole church full of people that liked me and loved me, but I also found out that God liked me and loved me and cared about me. And to be honest with you, even if people didn't like me or love me, I'm so grateful for a God who loved me and cared for me. In fact, he loved me so much, he gave his only son to die for my sins on a cross and gave his life completely for me that I could live with him forever. Talk about love that goes so deep. And so I was overwhelmed by that love and received that love, and I've never been the same. I, that completely, completely changed my life. You have faced similar things to this one way or the other. Even those who seem to be the most popular in, in school and stuff growing up have insecurities about themselves. And all of us, all of us have had people speak things into our lives that have damaged our soul and hurt us in some ways. And maybe it was a relative, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a close friend. Uh, it may have been while you were in school or it may have happened even as an adult. And I think, uh, and maybe this is, is uh, true or for some, but I think, especially girls, I think when comments were made about your appearance at some point and uh, just kids being mean, but you took that to heart and it damaged your soul. And I just want to say there's a God who's come to, to redeem that soul. He wants you to see yourself differently than maybe the way that pattern has been in your life to this point. So I want to encourage you. It's, and one of the saddest things about this whole topic of uh, hurt that happens through the words of others is how it can happen in marriages. I've been uh, flabbergasted when people and couples have come into my office and, and right in front of me have said some of the most heartless and cruel things to one another and, uh, or spoken of things that they've said to each other in, those, in the context of arguments and different things that have gone on. And I just shake my head and I think that is so devastating. It's so hard. I mean, words, when they're spoken, you just can't get those back. And, and a lot of people think, well, you know, it's just better to be truthful. It's better to get it all out there. Listen, I, I get what people mean when they say that, but there's something we call manners. There's something we call uh, being patient. 
salvation. There's something we call not da damaging unnecessarily other people and being careful about our words. There's no reason to speak that way into other people's lives that is so devastating. And so, uh, you know, I would just say it isn't always wise to speak everything that's on your mind. In fact, it's unwise to live that way. It's better to think things through and think of a careful way to say things in a way that's redemptive to say and to help each other in those times. And so, so uh, you know, indeed, one of the first signs of wisdom is that we don't say everything that we're talking about, to be quite honest. I highly recommend that, that, that we don't say the first thing that comes into our mind, okay? So, so and I'm, again, I'm all for honesty. I get that. But wisdom triumphs over saying what we thought and in, in what we, uh, or whatever is on our minds in that moment. But, but we all get hurt by intentional and sometimes unintentional things that are said to us or about us. And, and I'm here to tell you something. If you, if you believe what we're going to go through today, it will change the outlook of your life. It will change you from the inside out, and it will give you hope for a new day. Um, so let me talk to you a moment, if I may, about the origin of the, the... It mentions two groups of people, the Midianites and the Amalekites in our text today. And I want to I give you some context about these two groups of people, if I can. Back in Genesis, when Sarah died, Abraham remarried. And uh, he had six more children uh, with, with a, a woman by the name of Keturah. And out of these children, when they were grown, uh, Abraham gave them all gifts and sent them away so that his son Isaac would be uh, over that land of Israel that God had given his, because the promise was through Isaac and his descendants. But there are these other children. And so he had one son that was named Midian. Okay, Midian, one, Midian's descendants uh, continued to live in to the east of Israel and then sometimes even moved down south uh, into the Sinai Peninsula. And eventually a guy like Moses comes along. He goes out into the backside of the wilderness. He sees a shepherd picking on some uh, girls. He, he protects them. They bring him home. Turns out they're in the home of Jethro, who is a Midianite. Okay, And so, so there's this connection uh, of the Midianites back into the tribe of Israel. And so there's, there, that speaks of what we know about the uh, part of what we know about the Midianites. We also have this group called the Amalekites. Uh, when Abraham's grandson Esau uh, was old enough, he got married to, and he married instead of one of the people in his, that 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 God had wanted him to. He married one of the Canaanite women from that area, much to his mother's dismay. She, <laughs> Rebecca, was very upset about that. Esau's firstborn son, uh, or had a had a son, and he named him Amalek. And so the Amalekites became one of the biggest thorns in the side of Israel. As they were on their way uh, through the wilderness wanderings and on their way to Israel, the Amalekites would lie in wait for them. And the Amalekites would come, and when there were stragglers or uh, old or infirmed people that were straggling along and weren't keeping up in the, in the safety of the group, they would sneak around from behind and kill some of these people to just be a thorn in the side of Israel. And, and they were vicious about it. And so so, so here they have these Amalekites and these Midianites that, that are, are the ones that are being named as being troublesome to Israel. The point of mentioning them is that they are relatives, and it's these relatives that are taking, the, are taking their food, stealing their land, uh, and hurting the Israelites. And, and, and they're worse than taking their food. They're stealing their peace. They can't even, they're in a terrible time of turmoil. And, uh, and so all that to say, sadly, it is typically our relatives that are sometimes the worst offenders <laughs> when we are those who are uh, being hurt in some way. And, and, and in fact, you know, and, and so, so it's people that we sometimes live with. So don't say amen too loudly right now if you happen to be in the same room with someone. But, but let's continue with the text and, and let's see what God wants to do in, in this man, Gideon. In Judges 6-7, it says, When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt and into the land out of slavery, and I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, 
but you have not listened to me. Look, I'm not saying every time we go through a trial, it's because we've sinned or strayed. In this case, it was for them. But, but I can say that when we start straying, God is loving enough to, to allow the difficulties in our lives to, to help us because he wants us to correct our, uh, to have a course correction, if you will, to lead us uh, away from devastation and destruction in our lives. Would you agree that when things get tough in our finances or in our relationship or in some way like this, this virus that is around us and affecting our lives, we tend to focus on the Lord more. We tend to aim ourselves more toward prayer. And so God can use those things, if you will, as a servant to help us uh, to, to become more like him and to be changed as he would have us to. And so uh, picking it up now in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came down and, or, and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Threshing floors uh, were, were places where they were stone or maybe hard packed uh, dirt in places, almost like clay. And, and what would happen is they would either beat the, the, the sheaves or the stalks of weed or whatever, barley, whatever they were trying to harvest. And, or they would have uh, cattle walk on these, these and break them up. And then when they would thresh, they would throw that uh, grain in the air. And when it would, the slight breezes would come and the, the chaff would be broken off and it would drift away and into a separate pile. And so they would separate the wheat uh, from the chaff or the barley from the chaff around it. So, so this, is, this is how they normally threshed wheat. But, uh, uh, and it was usually in a level spot where the breezes could get to it. A wine press on the other hand, was usually a place that was carved out of limestone or some kind of stone, and it was a depression in the ground. It was lower where several people could get in and, of course, smash the grapes and, and create wine that way. But what, what we really see with Gideon here is that's a terrible place to thresh wheat. The breezes aren't getting to you, the, and, and it's uh, no doubt hot in there, and it's terrible work. I can't, I can't imagine. This was usually done in June and July, so the sun would have been directly overhead and, and uh, no help from the breeze. And so he's threshing wheat in a wine press, which tells us something about, uh, about Gideon is that he was fearful. He was afraid. He was hiding and not being strong and courageous. So the, the words of the angel that came to him and says, you're a mighty warrior, they seem contrary to the way he's behaving and the way that he's acting. Let's look at verse 12 now. It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So let me get this straight. This guy's threshing wheat in a wine press to hide because he's obviously afraid, and he's being called a mighty warrior. I have to be honest, as I look at him, I don't see it. But, but I love this about God, as he sees us as he desires us to be. He sees us as he wants us to be. And I love this because God is essentially pushing Gideon into a swimming pool full of alligators. <laughs> he, is, he is really forcing the hand of this guy to, to become what God wants him to become. I love that. Gideon's story is, is one of many in the Bible where God comes along and proclaims something over someone who, or a person who, and speaks of how that person will be, not of how they are at, or they act at that particular moment. To, to the childless and old Abraham, he spoke, you are the father of many nations. Uh, to the banished and fearful Moses, he said, you are the deliverer of my people. To the young and forgotten David, he says, you are a man after my own heart and will be the king of of Israel to a frightened and hiding Elijah uh, who's hiding in a cave all by himself. He says to him, you are not alone. You are not alone. And even to his own son, Jesus Christ, God speaks to him and says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And not that, not that Jesus was, um, you know, not secure in who he was, but I got to tell you, that tells me that even Jesus Christ needed his father to speak into his life. I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. We need to hear that. Praise God. I love that so much. 
Gideon will indeed lead his people into victory. He will lead a battle that we're familiar with the story where God whittles his army down to only 300 out of initially 20,000. And only with 300 people, he's able to absolutely do the works of God so that the entire Midianite army is defeated and destroyed and sent away. And it's an amazing, God gives him success and victory. He has doubts along the way, but he is he becomes what God spoke over him. How, how, and so I love that about this. Now, so I ask you about yourself. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself today? I want to encourage you that to, to stop looking back, looking back in your life to the, to the things that happened to you that you feel have defined you in some way, the disappointments and the hurts of yesterday as somehow defining your life. Back a few years ago, I was uh, down in Southern California walking through an a outlet mall, and I, I just saw this T-shirt that uh, on the rack, and it was just, just had writing on it, and I read the T-shirt, and this is what it said. It said, stop looking back. You're not going that way. Man, I, I almost bought that shirt. I love, I love the, the sound of that statement. Stop looking back. You're not going that way. Uh, you know, too many of us are looking back. We're, we're letting our past define us. If we're not looking back, sometimes we're looking to the side. We're being distracted by things of this world. We're, we're being pulled off course rather than following the plan that God has for our life. When I was 17 years old, we got a new pastor in our church, and he was also a general contractor. And one of the first things he came in and did is he said, hey, we, we were meeting in this old converted peach barn. It was, it was a pretty rough old building, and I remember there were giant um, uh, steel rods with turnbuckle kind of things on the end. Or literally, there was uh, two sets of them, and they were holding the walls from falling outward because it was just so old and messed up. So, uh, so anyway, he comes in and says, we need to build a new building. And, uh, and so he, he began to talk to the church about this. We raised the money, and uh, he, did, uh, he did most of the work, although some of the men of the church began to work. So that started in the spring and, uh, of the year that I was 17 years old, and, or was uh, turning 17 that summer, excuse me. And so, so I, uh, that summer, decided, man, I'm going to help. I, I want to help do this. I was inspired, and I wanted our church to have a new building. And so I got out there, and every, every day, where I was free and he was working on it. Uh, we worked on this together. And, and so at some point we put up the walls and they were, it was a two-story building. So the walls were at least 16 feet, maybe even uh, 18 feet off the ground on one side. And, and, uh, and I watched this guy, Gary, he would get up there and he would walk across these walls, the tops of these walls, sometimes carrying other boards and like a tightrope walker. And I was just petrified. I was scared. I was thinking, this is nuts. How can he do that? And, and, uh, and I, I would express my dismay to him and he, he explained to me, it's very easy. If you get up here and you don't look down and you don't look side to side, but you just look straight ahead, keep your head up and look straight ahead, your feet will follow your eyes. And uh, so he encouraged me to try it. And sure enough, I got up and pretty soon I was walking on these uh, two story walls without, without, and, and at some point it just, all of a sudden it was like it clicked and I, I didn't worry at all. And I was, I was almost running around on them because I was so assured that, uh, my feet would follow my eyes. And so, so uh, you know, and, and the thing is, again, I kept my eyes where they needed to be. And so I was walking on those walls like him. We're going along just fine in life. And, and then what happens is, you know, the devil will come and he'll throw up some memory of our past. He'll throw up something of the hurt that we had. And we get distracted by that. Or we start looking around again and we get distracted by the things of this world. We, and in the pain of that moment, all of a sudden we're stumbling. We're getting ready to fall. And, and, and so, you know, the, it's like the past is clawing at us and pushing and pulling at us and trying to define us once again. But don't look back. You're not going that way. Failures do not define you. Past performance does not define you. People do not define you. Yesterday does not define you, and not even your family of origin, listen, this is important, not even your family of origin defines you. Remember who God says you are. God defines you. God defines you. 
Here are some ways he defines you. And I wanna, uh, I'm gonna put these on the screen and I, I'm going to uh, say go and we're gonna read a line and we're gonna pause for a moment, but I want you to read these with me together out loud. Are you ready? Here's the first one, go. I am a child of God and I belong to him. Go. I am loved by God and nothing can separate me from his love. Go. I am chosen by God. Go. I am forgiven and my debt for sin is paid in full. Go. I am strengthened for all to which God calls me. Go. The Holy Spirit is with me and in me. Go. I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ, and go. I am never alone. God will not leave me. He will never forsake me. I don't think there's anything in this world the devil fears more than the people of God knowing who they really are in Christ. It is phenomenal. It's profound. You know, these are the kind of people like Gideon who will lead a, a small contingent of 300 to take over the vast army of Midian. These are the people, as the New Testament describes us believers, as those who will trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. That's what we're talking about here. We don't need to be pushed into a pool of alligators. We'll jump in if we know that God is with us and He said, I will be with you. And we go through the worst things in our lives because He really is with us. I love this. So, so how, I, I want to ask you, are you getting this today? God, God is defining who you are and what you are. And if you believe it and act upon it, there is an important aspect to this that we, as Lonnie said earlier, we must not only, uh, you know, uh, hear the word, but also put it into practice. Faith without works is dead. So, so we need to act upon it as well. If we do so, we will have success and victory in our lives. Well, of course, the rest of the story is that God, God used Gideon to defeat the Midianites and that Midian became the mighty warrior that God saw him to be. The rest of your story, my story, is yet unwritten. God is speaking over your life through this word right now uh, on this video, but also as you read the word of God and as you listen to different teaching and as you study, and he is speaking over your life and we must choose to believe in what he says and to act upon it. But, I, but, you know, as I think about the future, I think, what does the church look like at, when we can encourage each other? We're already doing that through s different, you know, texting and video chats and different kinds of things. But, but even coming together again, when we can encourage one another and we provide a place that people can come and find friendship and love and acceptance among us. And what does the church look like when we're helping each other to, to remember to see ourselves as God sees? Jesus. That's what I'm looking forward to as we go forward in all this. It's time to say, God, show me who I am in you and what you've really made me to be and get, let me get after it with the power that you give me to do it. There are many, many people out there who are hurting, who, who there will always be the Altons of life, the people we have had disagreements with that have tried to define our lives by saying things over us. But, but, and the devil wants to hear us to hear those things, and, and, but his lies don't define us. God does in Jesus' name. Let's pray right now over this. Uh, the time that we've had in the Word, and I want to pray for you. I want to ask you, if you would, to just stretch your hands out in front of you right now in a receptive posture. And, and if you're just ready to believe the truth that God speaks, as I pray, I want you to, to pray your own prayer to God and speak to Him and just invite Him to kind of download on you the things that you need to, to be spoken over in your life right now. So as I pray, go ahead right now, stretch out your hands in front of you. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this time that we've had in your word today. I pray for every single person who's listening to this, who's viewing this, that as they uh, are there with their arms outstretched in front of them to receive, that they will receive from you a download of what you want to speak over their lives, the, the reassurance, Lord, the, the truth about their lives, things that they wouldn't even believe about themselves, but you would speak it over 
over them, Lord. Some people need to hear right now that they are indeed mighty and able to face the trials that are ahead. Some people need to know that they are loved and appreciated. Some people need to know that, that they have grace to go forward and to do what they're deciding to do in their lives right now. But it, it, whatever the situation, whatever anyone needs, Lord, would you speak it to them as we receive from you now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And I want to say that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's as simple as believing that He is risen from the dead, uh, just as I did when I was a young man of 15. You believe that He died for your sins, you confess those sins, and you ask Him to come and be then the Lord of your life, which means He's taking over, He's in charge. And I want to invite you to do that. You can do that anytime. You can pray that prayer and say, God, come into my life. I make it making my life yours. Well, that's our time for today. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we're looking forward to seeing you again. Until we meet again, God bless you.